Hi, Michael. Hi. Today the question is, uh, what degree of mental purification is recommended before beginning these teachings? And what are the signs that we should detect in order to perform more mantra, japa, or meditation, and thus not believe that we are already at an advanced level? Um, we, firstly, we cannot measure the degree of our um, mental purification. So thinking whether my mind is pure enough or not is, um, is not a very fruitful um, speculation. The only, what is a sufficient sign that we have, the sign that we have sufficient mental purification is that if we are attracted to this path of self-investigation and self-surrender as taught by Bhagavan, and if we are genuinely want to try to follow this path, then we have sufficient mental purification. We don't have to think about any other uh, doing any other practices. Of all the means to purify the mind, the most effective is self-investigation. That is turning our attention back towards ourself. Because what are the impurities in our mind? The impurities are, um, are likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, which in their seed form are called vishaya vasanas. These vishaya vasanas, they, it, literally vishaya vasanas, uh, vishaya means phenomena, vasana means um, a propensity or inclination. So the inclination to, um, to attend to phenomena, to be the liking to be aware of phenomena is what is meant by uh, vishaya vasanas. So, um, they are the, those are the impurities because they are what draw our mind outwards. What is the most effective way to, um, to weaken those impurities, to reduce the strength of those impurities? It is by turning our attention within. At every moment we have a choice. Either we can attend to ourselves or we can attend to other things. If we attend to other things, we are feeding and uh, strengthening our vishaya vasanas. Whereas if we attend to ourselves, we are strengthening our love to attend to ourselves and correspondingly weakening our vishaya vasanas. So the most effective way to purify the mind is by self-investigation, by turning our attention within. All other means of purification um, are a bit of a roundabout way because we are um, instead of allowing our attention to go out after other things, we uh, try to focus it on one particular thing. But it's not even the, um, merely doing mantra japa or meditation doesn't necessarily purify the mind because mantra japa is an action of the uh, speech. Meditation is an action of the mind. No action is going to purify the mind. What purifies the mind it's the love with which we do the mantra japa or meditation. This is what Bhagavan has explained in um, Upadesha Undia. That is, uh, in the second verse of Upadesha Undia, he says the, na the nature of action is such that when, when we experience the fruit of an action, that is, where if, we, if we do an action, it has a certain consequence. If we do, uh, in, put in very simple terms, if we do good actions, it will have uh, good consequences. If we do bad actions, it will have bad consequences. But, but the consequences or the fruit of the action, we don't experience immediately. The actions we do in each lifetime, the action that is the actions we do with our will in each lifetime, uh, produce fruit. Those fruit get stored in what is called sanchitta. Sanchitta simply means the heap or the store of of the fruits of past karmas, which have not yet been experienced. And in each lifetime, God or Guru selects certain fruit from a big, from a big, um, from that huge store of our fruits of our past karmas, certain fruit are selected that will be most beneficial to us um, in this lifetime. But as Bhagavan says in verse two of Upadesha Undia, even though we ex once we experience the fruit of an action, that is exhausted. But even though the, the, 
the, the, that fruit is, it, when we experience it, the fruit is finished, it leaves a seed. That is, it, the, um, the, just like in a, in a fruit, take, say an apple, for example, you've got, the, you've got the edible part of the apple and you've got the seeds. If you eat the, the edible part of the apple, the seeds still remain there. Likewise, when we, even though we uh, experience the fruit of past karmas, the seed left by those karmas, that is the vasanas left by those karmas, the inclination to do the same actions again and again, they remain. So the nature of action is, uh, but everyone says it, uh, um, uh, it, the fruit of action having been experienced remains a seed and throws one in the ocean of action, in the great ocean of action. So it's, we cannot get out of this ocean of, of action, of doing, by doing more action. Therefore, he says, he concludes that verse by saying, vidu tarile, that means it will not give liberation. That means karma will not give liberation. <coughs> then how, if, if action, action here means action by mind, speech, and body, if action will not give um, uh, liberation, how to attain liberation? In the next verse, he, um, he, <coughs> he's, he says, nishkarmiya karma. Nishkarmiya karma means action done without, <coughs> not motivated by desire for any particular result. So, <coughs> action that isn't motivated by desire for a particular result <coughs> and done for God. The literal word, meaning of the words he used in Tamil are done for God. But what that implies is done with love for God. And in fact, in, the Malayal, in his Malayalam translation of this verse, he very explicitly put Ishwara Preeti and I. That means done uh, for the love of, uh, with, with love for God. So, if we do action without desire for a result, but only motivated by love for God, that action will purify the mind and show the way to liberation. So, but what, what purifies the mind is not the action itself. It is the love with which we do the action. So, what purifies, in other words, it is our love for God, the bhakti, that is what purifies the mind. Then he goes on in the next verse to say um, that, that he, he continues the same theme. So what sort of actions uh, can we do that will uh, purify the mind if they're done with love? Um, he says, um, uh, puja, japa, and dhyana. That puja means uh, bodily, physical worship. Um, uh, uh, japa means uh, vocal worship. And dhyana, med meditation, that means mental worship. Uh, well, mental, uh, men, yeah, mental worship, we can say. Um, uh, actions of body, speech, and mind. And in this order, they are, each is better than the other one. What he means by each is better than the other one is that each one will purify the mind more effectively. So rather than uh, um, puja is an, is an action of the body. That is a relatively gross way of expressing our love for God. A more refined way is to to do japa, and he in a later in a, a later verse he says, um, um, "Okay, I, I, I'll I'll explain you a bit more de detail." So, they, they, um, uh, puja is an action of the body. Uh, more subtle than that is japa, which is an action of the speech. More subtle than that is meditation, which is action of the mind. So, in this order, each one is more effective in purifying the mind. Then in the next verse, in verse five, he says, if you worship anything, taking it to be God, that is good worship of God. So it, he's not limiting it just to a particular form of ritual worship. Anything we do with love, uh, uh, anything, any bodily actions we do with love for God, that is uh, puja or, ja or worship. Um, then in the next verse, he talks about uh, japa. And he says, better than japa, uh, better than singing hymns is japa. Better than japa done aloud is japa done uh, softly within the mouth. And better than that is mental japa. 
that is doing just repeating the mantra or the name of God or whatever in one's mind. That is meditation. Then in the next verse, he goes on to say, rather than meditation that is interrupted, uninterrupted meditation is uh, more effective. In all these verses, when he's talking about effective, what he's talking about is its efficacy in purifying the mind. So in, in verse 7, he says, more than uh, interrupted meditation, uninterrupted meditation is, uh, is, is better, is more effective. Um, why is it more effective? Because remember, the meditation he's talking about is not just ordinary meditation. It's meditation done with love for God. All these we have to understand. They're all, he's all talking about, this is the path of bhakti he's talking about. So the love is the uh, key ingredient there. If you're simply, some people meditate in order to gain powers of mind or something, that is not going to purify your mind. That's just creating, um, strengthening the desire. So it has to be done without uh, a desire for any, uh, re any uh, result and ju just motivated just by the love of God. So, um, so all the, the, the meditation which is uninterrupted is best. Why? Because if we're meditating on God, and if our meditation is often interrupted, that means we keep on thinking of other things. That means the, the fact that we're thinking of other things means our love for God is not so, um, not so strong. But, uh, the more intense our love for God, the less we will be distracted by other thoughts. That is why the uninterrupted meditation is more effective. But it, the implication is because of the greater, because it's done with, and uh, the, the meditation being un, in, uninterrupted is the sign that we are doing it with great love, so it is more effective. But then in verse 8 he says, rather than meditating on God as something other than oneself, meditating on God as oneself, with the, with the uh, clear understanding that he is, our, he is what is shining in me as I, um, I'm paraphrasing here, this is the, uh, quite a literal translation. He says, anatinim utamum, that is the, the best of all. That means it's the best of all, um, of all the, these uh, practices of bhakti, of all forms of spiritual practice. The best is meditating on what he calls ananya bhakti, uh, ananya bhava. That means meditation on what is not abha. That means the implication is meditating on God as as I. So with the conviction that God is what is shining in one as, oneself as I, meditating on I, that is the best of all. So um, uh, he, he clearly implies there that uh, turning our attention back towards ourselves, being self-attentive, is the most effective of all means to purify the mind. So if we are, are attracted to this path, this is... Um, trying to practice self-attentiveness is, is a far more effective means of purifying the mind than any amount of uh, japa or meditation on anything other than I. So um, uh, e even if we make a little effort in this path, that, that will uh, go, go a long way. So we, we can purify the mind much more effectively by trying if, even if we don't succeed so well, even if we're trying and often failing, it doesn't matter. It's the, it's the nature. When, when, we, when a small child learns to walk, it, fall, it has to fall over many times before it learns how to balance. Or if we learn to ride a bicycle, we have to fall many times before we learn. So it doesn't matter if we fail many times. Just the effort to try to turn our attention back towards ourselves that is the most effective means of purifying the mind. So we don't have to worry about whether I got enough uh, purification of mind. <laughs> uh, the fact that we've been, we, we are drawn to this path, that we're attracted to this path, means we are ready. It, it, means, uh, it's, it, it doesn't mean that we are at an advanced level or anything. It just means this is the path for us. We have gained sufficient purification of mind by whatever other means. And now we... Uh, as I said, in verse 3, Bhagavan said that action done, nishkarmiya karma, desireless action done with love for God, will purify the mind and show the way to liberation. The way to liberation is self-attentiveness, turning our attention back towards ourselves. So if, we, if we're able 
when it, he says it will show the way to liberation means he will enable us to recognize that the way to liberation is to turn our attention within. So if we are ready to accept Bhagavan's teaching, but the best thing to do is to uh, be self-attentive, to try to attend to ourselves, to turn our attention back towards ourselves. If we are firmly convinced by that, then we have got sufficient purification, uh, purity of mind to begin on this path. So the mere fact that we're attracted to this path, um, that we're drawn to this path, means we, uh, we've got sufficient purification of mind to follow this path, because we wouldn't be attracted to it if we didn't have sufficient purification of mind, purity of mind. And uh, Michael, if, if uh, you said if any, any action done, done for the love of God, uh, gives uh, brings some purification of the mind, but uh, yes. Yes. that means any any action at all, any bodily action. Uh, yes, you said, that, that is why yes, Bhagavan says in the in um, the in the uh, fifth verse, he says, um, um, worshiping any of well, it has the, he uses a term there, um, enuru. Enuru can mean eight forms. That refers to a, um, um, a Shaiva Siddhanta uh, idea, what's called Ashtamurti, but God is in eight forms. God is each of the five elements, uh, um, uh, space, fire, air, earth, and uh, water. These five elements are, forms, are five forms of God. And um, the sun, the moon, and the jiva, the soul, these are all forms of God. <laughs> In effect, it covers everything. All physical, all material things, and all sentient beings, all are forms of God. So uh, if you, if you, um, if you um, for example, if you, it, it can include, for example, um, uh, Doing appropriate service to uh, to people or to animals. If you see if you see any living any sentient being suffering, whether human or non-human, and you try to alleviate that suffering, and if your motive for doing so is your love for God, because you see God in or you 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 have got that that bhava that attitude that God is in in each and every living being. If you so if you do it for the love of God. That will purify your mind. It also includes ritual worship, uh, the sort of worship that goes on in temples or mosques or gurudwaras or churches or whatever. I mean, it, 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 Bhagavan gives a very, very broad definition of uh, you can take any, anything, any physical thing, you can take it as a form of God. And if you worship with, with, with love, taking that to be a form of God, that is... Um, that is um, good, he says, Eastern Nal Pusa, that good worship of God. So it's the, it's the attitude with which we do the worship and the love, most important is the love with which we do the worship. It doesn't matter what we worship, because what, whatever we may be worshiping, we're worshiping with the attitude that we're worshiping God in that form. I guess there has to be some uh, some under better understanding of the teachings in in order to, uh, for example, to meditate on oneself as God, as you said also, which is the more uh, the best way to purify the mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because it's, since we are identified with our body mind still, and in, uh, we see it in a dualistic way, and it's hard for me to see myself as God, for example. So yeah, yeah, my meditation yeah. on God might be let's say, distorted by my still, yeah. in, let's say, yeah. immature approach to the teaching. For example, I don't, I don't fully understand the teachings. Yeah. And so well, naturally, when we start, when we first read the teachings, we don't understand them fully. We get a certain understanding of first reading them. We think about it and we try to make sense of it all. We try to understand why Bhagavan taught like this. Why is it reasonable to believe what Bhagavan has taught us, we, 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 that is, we, 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 we read or hear the teachings and we think about them. That is what, reading or hearing is what is called sravana. Thinking about it is called manana. But most important of all is putting it into practice. Because it's by putting it into practice that we purify our mind. And to the extent that our mind is purified, we gain clarity. 
So the clarity of uh, the, the clarity, the, the best way to understand Bhagavan's teachings clearly is to put them into practice. Study, studying them and um, thinking about them will, these are aids to the practice, but it's the practice itself that will give us the clarity. Yes, mm -hmm. and also of, uh, from all three, mantra, japa, and meditation, uh, mm. some people might say that they do meditation, for example, but th what they actually do is uh, to self-inquire, the self-investigation, just like they close their eyes and sit in silence, and instead of, med let's say, for meditation on an object or meditation on God, is to do self-inquiry, self-investigation. Yes, yes, yes. But me merely sitting, closing our eyes, and trying not to think of anything else, that is not self-investigation. Self we Self-investigation is self-attentiveness, trying to attend to ourselves, trying to see ourselves clearly, what we actually are. So it, it, that can be called meditation. Bhagavan sometimes refers to it as Swarupa Dhyana. Swarupa Dhyana literally means meditation on one's own nature. He also calls it in another place in Nana, he calls it Atma Chintana. Atma Chintana literally means thinking of oneself or thought of oneself. That means meditating on oneself or being self-attentive. So it can be described in different ways. So it can, we can describe it as meditation. But there's a reason why Bhagavan didn't describe it just as meditation. He described it as vichara. Vichara means investigation. Because in meditation, no, ordinary meditation, you're just trying to fix your mind on some object. But in this path, why we are attending to ourselves? It's not an exercise in concentration. We are trying to attend to ourselves in order to see what we actually are. So we, it's, this is an... an Inward investigation, self-investigation. So it, it, we, we can consider it as a type of meditation, but it is an investigative meditation. And what is it investigating? It's investigating ourselves. It's an attempt to see ourselves as we actually are, to be aware of ourselves as we actually are. Because and so, so long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves, being aware of other things is the nature of ego. It's not our real nature. So in order to be aware of ourselves as we actually are, we need to be aware of ourselves alone because our real nature is pure awareness. That's awareness that is not aware of anything other than itself. And don't you think that it's easier at, at first, for example, to, to, to do the self-investigation just sitting by yourself in silence instead of doing it in the midst of uh, your daily daily routine. When it's more, maybe it's uh, you can do it, I guess. But it's, isn't it easier to just sit in silence and uh, not to concentrate, as you said, but to really self-investigate? We we all have to find what works best for us. We need to try. This is an investigation, so we can trial and error. You can try and be self-attentive while you're traveling on the bus or, um, or when you're standing in a queue or, uh, or whatever, you can also try and be self-attentive um, when you go to bed or when you wake up in the morning lying in bed, you can uh, try to be self-attentive. You can do it when you're sitting in a comfortable chair. You can, if you like to, this sort of sitting with cross-legged, you, you can do it in any way. When, when people used to ask Bhagavan, what is the best asana? for self-investigation. Asana means posture. In yoga, they have a lot of different postures they sit in. So when Bhagavan was asked, what is the best asana? He said, Niditi asana. Niditi asana means contemplation. The implication is, it's not, the, it's not what the body is doing that matters, it's where our attention goes. If our attention goes within, that is good. It doesn't matter whether the body is walking or talking or sitting or lying or anything. But when we are doing this, we will find um, it, it may sometimes seem easier to do it when we, are, when we are sitting or lying with closed eyes. But we may find some, sometimes I know when we close our eyes, so many other thoughts come and distract us. So then we may find it, sometimes it may seem to be uh, better to do it while we are walking or something. So we, we just have to, what is, what is, the key thing is we must be interested to know what we actually are. 
to the extent that we are genuinely interested, but we have a real passion to know what we actually are, to that extent we will attend to ourselves. So this is, this is the, the pinnacle, as Bhagavan indicated in those first, uh, in verses two to, um, or verses three to eight of Upadesh Undia, this path of self-investigation, this is the pinnacle of the path of uh, love, of the path of bhakti. So what is key to uh, success in this path is the love with which we attend to ourselves. If we have no love to attend to ourselves, our interest in other things will, will be constantly taking our mind outwards. So we, we, by, by trying to attend to ourselves, we need to slowly, slowly cult cultivate that liking to attend to ourselves, that love to attend to ourselves. We need to have intense curiosity to know who am I. Um, 